Okay, good evening. Um, this talk is on the myth of Ur. It's really a presentation for the penny saver. The whole thing comes out to a great teaching and looking for a great teacher. So after we get the teaching, we should be able to describe the teacher and see whether we can find someone to fill the bill. All right, that's where we're going. So going into the myth of Ur, as we go through it, Plato concludes with a special kind of need for a certain kind of teaching, a certain kind of teacher, and that's how it culminates. So let's start. First of all, as you know, the myth of Ur is from the Republic. What is the need for the myth? There is a great need for the myth, and it comes out of the great problem of Plato's Republic, which I'll present here very simply. In book two, it says there's a great and difficult problem in deciding about the nature of justice, because up to this point, he says, everybody's talking about the idea of justice in terms of its consequences and its benefits. And he's been urged to talk about justice just in itself. And they, Glaucon people there, give him a challenge. And this is the challenge that's called the problem of the two lives. One man, brilliant, powerful, courageous, he gains the greatest reputation for justice. He gains all the benefits and the honors for gaining that reputation. He fools even his family. That is to say, he has very carefully and cleverly created a mask. And that mask is the appearance of justice. But in reality, everything he does is to benefit himself and no one else. Therefore, he's the pure, unjust man. But nobody can see it. He's able to fool everyone. And Plato then adds another dimension to this, which is very important. Even the gods are fooled. He is so clever and brilliant. And therefore, they're waiting to get him after he dies and have a great banquet in the heavens, for he has fooled everyone. On the other hand, there's another man here who is exactly the opposite. He is just, but to everyone, he appears unjust. Therefore, he gets absolutely no benefits from being just, no honors, no fame, and the gods in the heavens are waiting for him, and they're going to give it to him when he dies. Therefore, they challenge Socrates, therefore, let's strip away from this argument of justice all considerations other than one, show the effect that justice has on the soul of man. And show the effect it has in such a way, rationally, in such a way, that we can see that we would rather be this man than this man, given all the conditions of the argument. That's the argument of the, Repl of the Republic. What does he have to show? He has to show that it's better to be the just man under this condition simply because the effect it has on the soul is of such a nature that once seen for what it is in itself, anyone rational would much prefer to be this than this. That's the problem of the two lives. Socrates says, well, to do this, it's so difficult to see the soul. The soul is such a small thing, difficult to see. He says, therefore, I'm going to have to try to create an analogy with the soul and for the soul, and that will be the city-state. 
Therefore, he creates a city-state from its inception to its flowering and its decline. And that will be used as an analogy for the soul. Now, what will that do? You see, because in the second book, Socrates describes the state. It's rustic, it's simple, has very few luxuries, small community, they maintain their own existence. They have no drive for greed, power, or possessions beyond their needs. And Glaucon looks at that state and he says, Socrates, that's a pig state. Only a pig would want to live there. There's no luxuries. There's no couches. He says, oh, we must add that. That's right. He says, we must design a state in high fever. You see, because he has to show at the fullest development of the state, justice. And in its decline, you must therefore discover the unjust man. And therefore, he creates a state that can be shown to go through all of these kinds of changes to create a sense of justice in that state. And then it's necessary to climb to the unjust state. And therefore, this will appear as the just man. And this will, of course, appear as the unjust man. And he is the tyrant, all right, the terrible tyrant. And this, of course, is the philosopher king. or sometimes called philosopher guardian. Therefore, we have this construction of the state. It goes from three, four, and book five. Then he goes into the dynamics of the soul and the cognitive functions in six and seven and the allegory of the cave and the upper world, the divided line. And then from book eight on, which is the decline, right, eight, nine, and 10. Well, now look here. The key part to this story is not whether or not he can create an image of a just man. He has to do more than that, remember. He has to try to show us in some way what happens to the soul of man, of each of these men, upon death. That's the function of the myth of Ur. That's what it's doing. So let's take a look now with the myth of Ur. Simply, there is a battle. Battle is over. Many people were killed. And Ur, that's his name, he was thought to have been slain. And, and body was left on the ground. Ten days elapsed, and finally they pick up his body, did not seem to decay. But nonetheless, they put it on a funeral pyre, and they were about to light the fire on the funeral pyre. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm still alive. I have visited the next world, and I've been told to come back and to tell you my story of the next world. That is, to what happens to the soul after death. That's what we get here. What happens to the soul after death? And that's the myth of Ur. So we have a geography, very interesting geography. This is the heavens. This is the earth. There are two holes here, two holes here. And it's through these that the souls of men come. Now look, Plato has to in some way convince us that in the afterworld there is a justice, rationality, and intelligibility. That's what he has to show. And he has to show that that has an impact on this question of what happens to the just man and the unjust man. Because in the Republic, he has a great description of the, of the great tyrant. And the great tyrant, the most unjust man, the unjust man 
is brilliant. Has all of the intellectual qualities and capabilities that everyone would admire. Foresight, ability to plan, ability to direct, courages of his convictions, forthrightness, he can bring his plans to fruition. There's only one thing different between the unjust man and the just man, justice. They are equal. They are equal in every respect except that one, that one factor. So therefore, Plato also has the second problem. Where do these tyrants come from if there's this idea of reincarnation? And how do you account for the fact that one goes one way and the other goes? They are, in fact, twins. In terms of qualities and abilities, they're twins. In terms of abilities now, in terms of abilities, they're exactly alike. So therefore, in the myth of Ur, Plato has to go back to this issue and not only tell us what happens to the just man in the next row and the unjust man, he has to return to this issue of the twins. Therefore, going back now, so that after death, we are brought to the judge. And it's a very interesting place because when you are judged, if you are judged to be a just man, then you go up into the heavens. If you're judged unjust, down you go. Because for everything that you have done that is unjust, you suffer tenfold for each act, and equally well, it's multiplied by a hundred years. Ten acts, thousand years. Same thing here. Ten great acts, ten great virtuous acts, the great acts of excellence. Ten times the reward, hundred times. Well, the judge is also here for another purpose. Now, coming up from the journeys into the other world, having faced all of the punishments and all the difficulties, up you come when you've paid off your debt. Up through the second hole. And then you're judged. Judged in a very interesting way because you have to then choose your next reincarnation. And we'll go into the dynamics of the choice for the next reincarnation. Equally well, from the heavens, people then have gained their rewards and now they too are returning for the judge to pick their next reincarnation. That reincarnation has to be just, you see. This has to be an image of justice. And it has to have it in such a way that we can see that those coming here up from this can be treated fairly with a sense of justice equally coming down. And those that are going to return to these two regions, of course, must be shown that it is fair and just for them to do so. So let's take a look now. Um, I'd just like to read one thing about this. Plato has something that has often troubled some people, and therefore I'd like to mention it. He says, however, that there are some people who are so unjust that they'll never come back. And this is the man that he calls the great Adraeus. Because when they go down and they get before the judge and these people are coming back from the heavens and coming up from the bowels of the earth to be judged, they all get together and they tell stories about where they've been and what they experienced and what they've learned in the two regions. And they trade stories. And every once in a while, someone will say, okay, where is the worst of all the tyrants? And they report that every time it looks like he's ready to come back up once again to be judged, that the hole closes and bellows and screams and, and uh, the attendants have to come up and pick him up and drag him back down for his crimes are so heinous that it appears that he will never, never, 
again come up to the surface and be judged. So that's the extreme case. All right. No return. Now in terms of symmetry, in the same way, is it possible that there's no return the other way? I mean, is it symmetrical? If there's no return for the worst, all right, the worst tyrant, well, is it possible that there's a tenfold reward for each by a hundred years and the greatest example of pure justice will also have no return? If it's symmetrical. Now, what's curious, this whole issue is quite interesting philosophically, isn't it? Because if it is symmetrical, then this is a very clearly a Buddhist uh, principle, getting off the wheel of reincarnation. This is a Buddhist principle. And if Plato is hinting at that, suggesting it, saying it, well then that's quite a point to be made for him. And then we'll have to position his writings in one way, if not in another. So that's what's at stake. So, let's go further. After seven days, they're gathered together, they're swapping stories. And then on the eighth day, they move forward for four days on a journey to the very center. And at center, there is a pillar of light. There's a pillar of light. That's luminous, radiant luminosity, pillar of light. And it goes from the tops of the heavens to the bottom. It is the core that runs through all reality. And there's also through this the spindle of necessity. And around that spindle of necessity, around the spindle of necessity, he locates all of the planets, the whole, for him, the whole universe. And the outermost ring of that is the eighth ring, which is the realm, of, sometimes called the realm of the fixed stars. A sound is uttered. One sound is uttered. And each of the heavenly bodies that moves around in its orbit plays off that one sound. And as a consequence, there is a harmony of the spheres of the entire universe. The whole entire universe is the harmony of the spheres around this pillar of light that is carried from the, the extremes of heaven and earth. And therefore, you see, he's telling us in a very nice way, the whole thing is ordered and it's an intelligible model. That gives us a little confidence then that he must be doing something and constructing something with so much care that we can expect that he'll be able to deal with these other themes with equal precision and hope, hopefully, intelligibility. So, now, what happens now? Well, this is the big moment, of course, when they go before uh, uh, the fates. And then they go before the four Lachis, Clatho, <clears throat> which is really the image of personification of the three aspects of time or eternity, I propose. Lachis, therefore, is the personification of time of all that was. She plays the dominant role. Clutho, present. Atropo, future. Now there's an interesting play on this within the text, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> These are the three aspects of time of eternity. And as you know, eternity in Platonic thought 
is a simultaneous whole that stands as the mean term in the realm of the intelligibles. And the three aspects of eternity can then be shadowed or seen as Lachey's Clitho and Apropos. Now, <clears throat> this is really uh, on the all that was gains its status, as you know, because that presupposes it had, it had once been a future, was present, and now is past. And therefore, it comprises in its experience all time. Present, of course, is only that which is present and includes the future. And of course, future is only one solitary domain. He breaks each of these up in threes, which we can go into later. But this is the great triad <clears throat> that we find in Neoplatonic thought again and again. It's a triad within which they are triads. So that you can represent it this way. And I can. So this is the realm of Laches that was. This is Clatho, which of course is the realm of what is. And Atropos is the future will be, right? That will, will be. Ah, pardon me, it should be here. Each one of these have three verbal forms, and therefore the entire set is nine which is typical of Platonic and Neoplatonic thought because it represents a mean analogy structured as a triangle. Then, Laches then brings all of the souls together. Actually, they're brought together by a prophet called the prophet. He brings them together. And Laches is there. And the following story unfolds. This is what must happen. Um, everyone is there to see their destiny, where they're going, what's going to happen to them. And we're going to talk now about those that have come up and those that have come down and are going to fix their next reincarnation. These are the ones that have balanced out all the good and received all the rewards for all of their excellences. These, they have already paid off whatever it is that they owed as punishment. And there, by the way, most importantly in this, uh, it's very important that there is no learning that can take place in the world of, of the dead. No learning. Only the consequences, see, it's only the consequences that you have incurred as a result of your life. Uh, these are the consequences of the life you've lived. Only. These are the consequences of all of the virtue and vice, all of the virtue or excellence and folly. There is no place in this entire story when anybody learns anything. They're not transformed. There's no growth. There's no evolution of the spirit. Consequences only. Uh, how that fits into the mythology, by the way, fits into the Phaedrus. In the Phaedrus, he pushes this theme and shows how this is connected with the earthly existence and why it must be this way. But let, let, let me hold that for a moment, okay? Now, they're brought together and we're told that lots are tossed to each person with a number on it. And that allows them, therefore, to line up appropriate to their number. And that will give them the chance, therefore, to move forward and to pick out the particular pattern of life that they find most attractive. They have to pick it. Well, those who get the number one, they run forward, look at everything, pick up the numbers, Pipeline, you pick up the patterns of life that uh, they find most attractive, and then that's stamped in later 
destiny stamps it in and that becomes the pattern for their next life. Let's, let me put it in other terms. Your karma is paid off in this game. It doesn't continue. Your karma, it's paid off. You don't get any new. The book is just balanced. Karma is balanced. Not nullified, balanced. Well then. Now, in this he then has to show that there's some justice in it. And now I'd like to quote a couple of lines that I find very important for us. And the first is, all right, let me read you a couple quick lines. And uh, I'm using the lobe, so I'll shout out a couple of the names. I'm on the 617 Stephanus number E, page 507 in the lobe. No divinity shall cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own deity. Let him to whom falls the first lot select a life to which he shall cleave of necessity. And now here comes the just part. Every party is going to put this. But virtue has no master. Excellence has no master. Each shall have more or less of her as he honors her. Or does hers despite. Let me do it again. Right? It's a very interesting notion. For virtue has no mastery over her. Each shall have more or less as he honors her. So therefore, we are going to select a lot right? that will allow us to, sect, to select a life to the degree that we honor the deity, to that degree, we are then bound by that choice. Whoever took a lot saw plainly what number he had drawn. Then the prophet placed the patterns of lives before them on the ground, far more numerous than those in the assembly. They rushed forward and picked one up pick one up. Here, here's now this. How is the choice made? How is the choice made? How do people choose them? He says it's a function of their character. They see, character is constant through karma. Character is constant in Plato. Let me give you the line. The choice of a different life inevitably is determined by different character. Different character chooses a different life. And this is the chief reason why it should be our main concern. This should be our main concern. If they're right, let's, let's make sure we're together. All right? You're going to choose a life. Of course, you first get your lot, whether you're first or second or third, to make your choices. Are oh, there are all kinds of patterns of lives all over the place? You're going to choose one. Your choice is going to be determined by your character. Then, wait a minute then. What influences your character? Because if there are better and worse choices to be made, and it's not based upon anything that you have paid off because your karma is balanced. The choice is made in terms of your character. Well, then what influences character? Sir? 
the choice of a different life inevitably is the consequence and is determined by different character, different character, different choice of life. What determines that? What determines that? Well, this is where we need the ad. There is a certain study, and if we have a study, we need someone who's going to be the teacher. And I think certainly local universities, you should be able to get a couple of instructors who can fill this, right? So we need a teacher, using that word in the best sense, because there's a major study. This major study is going to make flexible character. It's going to give us a degree of freedom. Let's see how we can gain it. I'm now at uh, page 509, 618C. every variety of lives, the lives of all kinds of animals, all sorts of human lives, tyrannies among them. Some lives uninterrupted until the end, others destroyed midway. Some exiles, some end as beggars. And they were lives of men of repute for their forms of beauty and strength and likewise a proudness of high birth, of virtues, as well as ill repute of the same things, similarly, of course, of women. All of these things are commingled with one another and with wealth and poverty and sickness and health and indeterminate conditions. Here, therefore, is the supreme hazard for man. How can you possibly choose? Okay, here's the way he starts. This is the chief reason why it should be our main concern that each of us, neglecting all other studies, should seek after and study this thing if in any way he may be able to learn and to discover the man who will give him, here we go now, he must seek his study and find a man who will be able to give him the ability and the knowledge to distinguish that life that is good from that which is bad. Always and everywhere to choose the best that the conditions of life allow. Taking into account all the things we've spoken of, and estimating the effect on the goodness of his life. This is the study, you see. We have to find a man who can teach us so we can master this study. Well, he's going to have to show us how we can choose the best possible, uh, that we can choose best, given the conditions that we are under. Not ideal, but where we exist and how we exist how to choose the best for ourselves. The second point, I perhaps I didn't make it clear enough, and therefore I want to pause for this. He puts in this, and reflecting on all that we have said in the dialogue, see, uh, reflecting on all that we've said on the dialogue, therefore this man must know the Republic, reflecting on all that we've said in this dialogue about the nature of justice and injustice. This man then should have a study that should allow us to see the effect, the effect on the goodness of life and the opposite. We should know how to combine various lives and their various combinations. And he should in some way show us how to fix our lives, our eyes on the soul by choosing the best possible life given the conditions we're in. And that's always the mean between the extremes. So therefore, I would like to just read a couple of those lines again. Right. These are the combinations, number four. We have to know how beauty can be commingled with poverty. 
Wealth combined with what habit of soul operates for good and evil? What are the effects of high and low birth and private station and public office and strength and weakness and quickness of apprehension and dullness and all similar natural and acquired habits of the soul when blended and combined with one another? So all these things, see, we'll be able to make a reasoned choice between the better and the worse life. This teaching then should cause us to fix our eyes on the soul, naming the better life that which tends towards justice and the opposite injustice. Now, the next curiosity is why he says this is so important is because for him, whatever it is there you learn in this great study, you need it not only then when you return to the earth, right? returning to the earth, reincarnation, He said there's another more difficult thing to realize, he says, because in the heavens, you're going to experience similar things only with greater intensity and power. And therefore, you need the very same things. You have to learn these very same things, not only for your life and your reincarnation, but your journey into the other world. Let me read how he puts it. But all, other but all other considerations he will dismiss, for we have seen that this is the best choice, both for life and death. A man must take with him to the house of the dead an adamantine faith in this, that even there he may be undazzled by riches and similar trumpetry, and may not precipitate himself into tyrannies and similar doings, and so work many evils past cure and suffer still greater damage to himself. It's possible, it's possible, therefore, if you take whatever it is you brought with you up here, and you'll face the same things. You'll face the same things, only greater there. Solve the problem here with this study, and therefore, you can prepare yourself for going through the difficulties in the next world with ease. Excuse me, when does this study take place? In this life? Yes. Yeah. You've got to find a man who will do that. That's why we need the penny saver. We're going to put an ad, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what they do on the penny saver in my neighborhood. Everything, is for, everything goes to the penny saver. Uh -huh. Can you find a teacher? <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll have. So he wanted a teacher, and we'll list all of these, all, and we'll type it up so it looks very neat. And, and, and uh, we can. of course, we'll want a demonstration of some of these things, won't we? And we do, right? And I hope it's cheap. Therefore, a man must always choose in such things the life that is seated as the mean to shun the excesses in either direction, both in this world, as far as it may be, and in all the life to come. And this is the greatest happiness for man. Therefore, that teaching should be the greatest happiness for us here and in the next world. Then the prophet comes in and he makes several interesting statements and that's what I'm going to call the three virtues or excellences and I may call them four depending upon how I break it but I'll give you the way that it is. The prophet then comes in at this point. He's the messenger. Even for him who comes forward last if he makes his choice wise, wisely and lives strenuously there is reserved an acceptable life and no evil. Regardless of the choice you've made, even if you made a poor choice, 
there's still the possibility if he makes his choice wisely and lives strenuously, there's, there is still possible to have an acceptable life. When the prophet had spoken, right, he threw out the, the lots, of course, and at once sprang the greatest tyranny. And of course, the man who chose it is the man we want to study. In his folly and greed, he chose it without sufficient examination. He failed to observe that it involved the fate of eating his own children and other horrors. And that when he inspected at leisure, he beat his breast and bewailed his choice, not abiding by the forewarning of the prophet. For he did not blame himself for his woes, but fortune and the gods and anything except himself. Well, how is it that that man could make such, where did he come from? Out of what blindness did he make that choice? Because that is the unjust man. Thank goodness we have another sentence. He was one of those who had come down from heaven. Had he come down from heaven? A man who had lived in a well ordered city or polity in his former existence, participating in virtue by habit. He was a good man. What was it? He did it by habit. He was a good man. He did a lot of good things. He lived in a city. But he did it all by habit. Here comes the big one. And not by philosophy. And one may perhaps say that the majority of those who were thus caught were of this company. And had come from heaven inasmuch as they were unexercised in suffering. But most of those who came up the other way, since they themselves had suffered and see the, seen the sufferings of others, they didn't uh, make their choice precipitously. For which reason also there was an interchange of good and evil for most of the souls as well because of the chances of lot. Yet, right? so coming up, they had seen suffering of themselves and others, and therefore their choice was not precipitous. They weren't going to just grab something. They wanted to examine it. Therefore, they made better choices. Coming down, unexperienced with suffering, they rushed over and picked the one that looked the best without examining it. So it's the good man. Hey, it's the man who was a good man in his former reincarnation, who came down from heaven with all the glories of having lived a good life and having received all the rewards of it. But what kind of a man was it? It's only good by habit. He avoided a life of wisdom. Therefore, that was not in his character. And everything we do is determined by the habits of our former life. All is determined by a former existence. The prophet said it was strange and pitiful and a ridiculous spectacle as the choice was determined for the most part by the habits of our former lives. He saw that, then he mentions a whole bunch of souls who choose this life and that life. And finally, he gets to the great choice of Odysseus. And Odysseus was so cautious about choosing his next life, his next pattern, that he waited until the last, and he picked this one up, and he said, had I seen this at first, I would have chosen it. But this is my life. This is the good life. Let's see what it was. And it fell out that the soul of Odysseus drew the last lot of all and came to make his choice. 
and from the memory of its of, and from his memory of, a, of its former toils having flung away ambition he went about for a long time in quest of the life of the ordinary system citizen who minded his own business and with difficulty he found it lying in some corner disregarded by the others so what life did he choose an ordinary citizen who minded his own business When Plato in the seventh book of the Republic, when the philosopher king is forced to go down into the cave once again, he has a great statement from the Odyssey. And it comes from Odysseus, who's in the Hades. And Socrates quotes it because he's asked, he's, uh, pa -pa -pa pardon me, Achilles, not Odysseus. Uh, so he asks, say, Oh, what is it like here? And he says, I would much prefer to be the poorest slave to a landless lord than be master of all the dead that lie here. Anything. Right? Poorest slave to a landless lord than be master of all the dead lie, they lie here. So therefore, in another place he says, therefore the best life is a quiet life. Let the storms of destiny pass over you. Find a place that's quiet. Do your philosophy. Don't be obtrusive. But, of course, this is what Socrates did. <laughs> That's the good life, <laughs> to be able to play out your fate. But that's Odysseus. He drew the last lot of all and came to make his choice. And from memory of its former toils, having flung away ambition, he went for a long time in quest of his life of an ordinary citizen and minded his own business. He looked at it and he said, I would have done the same and I had drawn from the first lot and chose it gladly. Then Laches came and she sat with each as the guardian of the life chosen, a genius, genus, genus, that he had chosen. And this divinity led the soul first to Cletho under her hand and her turning of the spindle to ratify the destiny of his lot and choice. And after contact with her, the genus then led the soul to the spinning of Atropo. And that became the web of destiny, irreversible. And then, of course, they passed through the river of forgetfulness and are reborn. I want to read, though, therefore, the guide. There's an extra addition. There's a curious addition, too. I'll take the, the guide first. This is the ending of the myth of Ur. This is where Socrates comes back. And it will save us if we believe it, this myth. And, and we will safely cross the liver of Let and keep our soul unspotted from the world. Here we are now. But I'm at uh, 519, page, and 621, uh, Stephanus number 621C. But if we are guided by me, he says, but if we are guided, he's the guide, but if we are guided by me, we shall believe that the soul is immortal capable of enduring all extremes of good and evil, and so sh we shall hold ever to the upward way and pursue rightness and righteousness with wisdom always, and ever that we may be dear to ourselves and to the gods both during our sojourn here and when we receive our reward rewards as the victors and the games go about to gather in theirs. And thus, both here and in that journey of a thousand years, whereof, whereof I have told you, we shall fare well. So he ends up being a guide. So if we're guided by me, we shall believe, one, the soul is immortal, capable of enduring these extremes. Therefore, it must be, in fact, a very vast and powerful thing. 
And so we shall ever be drawn to the upward way, pursue righteousness with wisdom, always, both for ourselves, so that we may be dear to ourselves and to the gods, both for our sojourn here and the next world. Right. Now, remember, we were on this curious problem, and I'd like to give it to you now. it up here for us. I'm at uh, 619E. Five thirteen. but that the path of his journey but that the path of his journey hither and the return to this world not be underground Okay, that's the quote. I'll read the whole sentence. Yet, yet if at each return to the life of this world the man loved wisdom sanely, and the lot of his choice did not fall out among the last, we may venture to affirm from what was reported hence that not only will he be happy here, but not only will he be happy here, but the path of his journey hither and the return to this world will not be underground and rough, but smooth and through the heavens. Very curious. Um, I put something else up here. It's going to be a little clumsy first.
Okay. Okay. Um, this, now, there's a, there's certain things that are assumed in this translation that, according to the translator, the judges, the context suggests this and it requires it <clears throat> because it's very sparse at this point. Hence to the other, and hither back, uh, right. hence to the other, uh, to the other place, and back, hither back, going back, right. or our journey going back, this is a back journey, right. return journey not going beneath the earth, but going heavenly. As, um, we, as I said, we can clean that up, make it a little better in English, but um, look what we have here. But that the path of his journey hither and the return to this world will not be underground and rough, but smooth and through the heavens. Oh yeah, but smooth, yeah, but smooth, that's there. But smooth and heavenly, that's all. Well, hence to the other world, that could, that's easily said. And hither, further, our backward journey, right, our backward journey is, we're not going to go beneath the earth, but smooth and heavenly. Of course, he made this through the heavens, but it's uh, heavenly. Well, this is the problem of context. You create a context and you have to assume it and add things to it to render this passage. <clears throat> but um, this is the philosopher. See, this is the philosopher. This is presumably the just man. So let me read it for you. Now I'm going to cut out certain words that are added because of the context and read it again. Yet, if at each return to life a man loved wisdom and the lot of his choice did not fall out among the last, we may venture to affirm from what was reported that not only will he be happy here, but that his journey hither will not be underground and rough, but smooth and heavenly. What does that mean? Now, I have some friends who play with Greek much better than I do, I assure you. And they're playing with us because if you read it in one way, it looks like the idea is that the philosopher will not return, but he will go on, <clears throat> not going beneath the earth, right? but will take the trip that's smooth and heavenly. The whole question then is whether or not this entails the idea of reincarnation or not. 
clumsily, clumsy as it is, I'm trying to keep the words in the due order in which they appear. <clears throat> now, so the whole question is, does the context justify this? But all through it, the translators are putting in these phrases that aren't there. Therefore, they may be creating the context to translate it this way, with pieces that emerged earlier. So that's the fun that I thought I'd leave you with. It's unfinished, <clears throat> and it's, you know, I hope I, next week I'll have a, uh, an answer, at least a tentative answer, of how this should best be handled. So that's my myth of myth of Ur. Now let's go back to the beginning and see what we have. All right. See if we can now recall the original questions. <clears throat> How did he make his choice? How did he make his choice? He was a good man. Did many, many good things. Previously came down from the heavens, has all the qualities, twins, but his choice was precipitous. He didn't keep in mind the sufferings, therefore he made his choice. Looks like this man made his choice not just from experience, but from this curious study that's called wisdom. <laughs> to become the philosopher king requires a certain study. That's called in book six and book seven, the training of the philosopher king, mostly book seven. Now here's our question. Does this study of the philosopher king come down in the end to be those six points where we have to find that kind of a man? So I'd like to go back to it once more and take a look at the study. This is the chief reason why it should be our main concern that each of us, neglecting all other studies, should seek after and study this thing, if in any way he may be able to learn and discover the man who will give him the ability and the knowledge to distinguish the life that is good from that which is bad. One. Two, always and everywhere to choose the best that the conditions allow taking into account all things of which we have spoken of, all of the Republic, estimating the effect on the goodness of his life on the soul, their conjunction or severance, the way in which they affect both positively and ne negative, and then to know these combinations, to know how beauty can mingle with poverty or wealth, and combined with what habit of soul operates for good and evil, what are the effects of high and low birth in private public station and office, strength and weakness, quickness of apprehension and dullness, and all similar natural and acquired habits of the soul when blended and combined with one another, so that with consideration of all these things, he'll be able to make a reasoned choice between the better and the worse life. With his eyes fixed on the nature of the soul, naming the worse life, that life which tends to make it unjust and the better life that which will make it more just. All other considerations dismiss, for we have seen that this is the best choice both for life and for death. So that's our ad in the penny sale. All right, want to, all right, we'll hire you. I want to know how. It's the teacher has to teach us how to know. <laughs> Oh, to know what beauty mingled with problems and riches. How to know. How yeah. To know. Yeah, that's right. So, You're right. That's what it is. Give us that teaching. <laughs> I agree with you. I'm making the ad. In two minutes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> however, however he does it, fast or slow, right? Hot, fast or slow, right? How does character, I mean, I don't like this character. To know how in, these things combine. Constant. Excuse me. Right, yes. If, if character is constant, I mean, does, isn't it introduce a huge amount of predestination in this yes. system? Yes. And I, I, does he talk about where it comes from? Endless. Constant? Endless. This goes on endlessly. There's only one thing that can break out of it. And that's wisdom. Or finding that man, right? The guy was, that's why it's important. Get it in the penny saver. We'll look for contributions later. Or woman. Man or woman, man in general. Right. The mean there, is that pretty close to mm -hmm. the middle road in Buddhism? And Confucianism? Yeah. Yeah, the mean in action. Shows up yeah. Again, oh, yeah, it shows up. Again. Oh, yeah. You know, it just certainly does. Yeah. See, that's also finding the right combination. It's how much of this, how much of that mean, always mean. Yeah, balanced. Balanced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing we can clearly demand, a, a good reflection on the republics, and that's the second condition. must know what it is we've said and covered, and that's what's, of course, the Republic. Now, there may be a lot out there, so we may be able to get one relatively cheap. I'm curious about number two. Are you ready for a question? I'll read it for you, man. Yeah, that's the way he puts it. Goodbye, Kevin. Is that where you are? Oh, that one. Yes. I'm on page 509. And taking into account all the things of which we have spoken, I take that to be of all the things that were spoken in the dialogue. On the other side. Number three, under virtues or excellences. Did you, did you mean to say goodbye, Kevin? Oh, oh, yeah, that's uh, perhaps too, too much abbreviated. Um, let me read it in. That's a nice, uh, nice one. Um, Yet if at each return to the life of this world the man loved wisdom sanely and the lot of his choice did not fall out among the last, we may venture to affirm for what has, from what was reported thence that not only will he be happy here but his journey, etc. Well, that's not the right one. Hold on. Yes, yes, okay, it's right here. He said that it was a strange, pitiful, and ridiculous spectacle as the choice was determined for the most part by the habits of their former lives. Um, Can I take you back to 619? Pardon me? I think what was confusing me was that uh, that list there looks like a list of virtues or excellences. But I thought that list came out of the quote which said... Oh, there you're right. You're right. Yes, please read. Yes, that's by, right. Not by habit, or by, it's habit without philosophy. That's right. Yeah, could you read it? How yes. The tyrant, how the tyrant comes back into this world as somebody who came from heaven. That's right. And he was one of those who had come down out of that's heaven right. 
He had lived his former mm -hmm. life in a well-ordered community with some share of virtue, which came by habit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Excuse me, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that doesn't seem like that would be one of the virtues to have habits. To be good by habit doesn't seem to be a virtue. It would seem you would not want to be good You're, by habit. You happen to be right again. So yeah, I yeah, that's right. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Substitute it for the other one. Right, good. Yeah, that's right. This is the, the, the tyrant, the one who chose the, the, the tyranny. Yeah, let, let me make sure of that and uh, substitute it, all right, because it's a good one. Um, Okay, the first one is that um, even for him who comes forward last, if he makes his choice wisely and lives strenuously, there's reserved an acceptable life, not an evil one. That's the first one. Okay. Um, oh, oh, yes, that's right. Good by habit. Um, it's the rest of the quote which I didn't put there, and that's why there's a problem. It's a contrast. Let me read it. He's one of those who, who had come down from heaven, a man who had lived in a well-ordered polity in his former existence, participating in virtue by habit, not by philosophy. All right. So therefore, good by philosophy or wisdom. All right. Not by habit, but by philosophy. And therefore a man has to love wisdom sanely so that his lot doesn't fall out among those that are, right? So then you have to love wisdom, let me make it even clearer, love wisdom sanely as he calls it. Right? These are the three. All right. Thank you for that, that's helpful. Good, 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 good. good. any questions? Um, what is the difference between these three? Because philosophy mm -hmm. is lo love of wisdom, wise, I mean, they're all, all they're the same word. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You just repeated the same thing, saying it in three different ways. Well, choose wisely. Uh, you're going to be good by philosophy, and you're going to love that wisdom intelligent, intelligently. I don't know whether that's possible, by the way, for myself. I've always found that curious, that last one, because... Uh, the, the, the word sanely doesn't fit, uh, and it's likely to be uh, a mistake. Um, that is to say, not a mistake, could be an alternate way of translating it. Let me look. Um, maybe it means that uh, you need to know why you are good and not being good. Uh, doing the good, being aware of it, that's what it means when it says philosophy. It doesn't mean the love of wisdom there. When it says to be good by philosophy, it means being good not by habit, but by examining it yeah. and deciding. Oh, yeah. Being aware. Yes, yes. Quite true. So it's, not, it's, it's not the it's, same thing as the third thing. Yeah, yeah. The love of wisdom is a different thing than the philosophy of the second. Oh, sure, yes. Can you help us with this one now? With the word sanely, loving wisdom, sanely. That's the one we're on. That's the puzzle. Let me take a look. It's like loving the truth. I mean, Pardon? Truth, wisdom, the truth is related to wisdom. Uh, say it another way. truth, then you must love wisdom. Ah. Ah, well, look, look here. Let me do something. Let, let me. Uh, no, that's that's that's. Um, um. It's fair saying something like uh, mediocrity in all things, including uh, your love of mediocrity. Okay, I'll 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 look it up right here for a moment. Um.
I won't. Yugios. Do you know? Do you know Yugios? Do you know? You know that word? Yugios. I have to look it up. I don't know. That's like from idiot, <laughs> idiot, but it isn't. Um, um, Well, could, could, yes, yes, yes. That's what I also yeah, 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 yeah. From, uh, but why would he put sane way then? I didn't think it was, since it's wrong word, right? Wrong, wrong word. Yeah. Problem. Yeah, good, good, good. I like that for, for, for change. Yeah, thank you. Good group, good group. Yeah. Good, good. So Together. if it is a healthy love of wisdom, which goes to yes, your knees, yes, yes, that's what it should be, right? A healthy love of wisdom. Yeah, 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 yeah not, yeah. not yeah. too much. Yeah, not sanely, not Not sanely. Yes. Not, 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 not an angle. Yeah, I mean, right. You can healthy, have too much of a good thing. A healthy love of wisdom is, is far preferable. Yeah. We'll have to let the translator know. He's probably dead. <laughs> then he's up there in the heavens. <laughs> Ten times for that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Ten times for that. Yeah. Probably yeah. carrying yeah. carrying a, a heavy Greek dictionary through the <laughs> Right? <laughs> we just got a chariot that carries it. Mm, could be. Right? Could, could, could. <laughs> bum, bum. could that smooth and heavenly be implied yes. that that right. can mean yeah. not Pardon? like Nirvana? Excuse me, I lost it. it that smooth and the top, the real thing, the smooth and heavenly. Could, did you say that it could imply like a Buddhist nirvana where you don't, the bad, you say extreme bad don't yeah, come back. Yeah, could yeah. this be where you say the extreme That's, good perhaps? See, there's so much involved in right. whether, if we go in this direction. Yeah, it would make it symmetrical, but it would push some uh, professors uh, in the wrong way. Because, uh, uh, well, I enjoy the uh, going over the myth of her again, and uh, thank you for playing with me this evening and, and participating and contributing. Any other things we can do with it, please? Any questions, or you want to go anywhere with it, please? Yes, I would like to know why learning is not possible in the underworld. Since you're experiencing yeah. the consequences of your actions, yeah. and why are you not yeah. capable of learning? Yeah. And also, yes. Yes. the same people have said that um, when they get sent down there, they have to wear a badge on their back. Yes. That's all that they ever did. Yes. No, not when they come back, when they go up. When they go down. When they go down. As well, yeah, they have to carry that. This is what I've done. But it, it's on their back. Yes, yes, yes. So they can so just read yes. other people's. Yes. Yeah. So that's all they live with, mm -hmm. is the consequences of what they've ever done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Plato's Phaedrus, there is another myth, and the, the way to study Plato is to take, if we could get a master artist, it would really be the ideal thing to do would be to take all the myths, because each can be linked with the others, mm -hmm. and we could have a vast mosaic. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, really. Because, you see, the Phaedrus picks up from this point. It picks up... Uh, The entire Phaedrus goes this way. It's really a journey of the soul as it struggles to gain uh, a vision of ultimate reality into the intelligible region, and the entire metaphysics is like a, uh, you might say, a journey of the soul is the metaphysics of Platonic thought. So the journey of the soul finally up to the highest ultimate reality, since they are degrees of it in Platonic, Neoplatonic thought, uh, there is so much 
uh, enthusiasm and, and drive for trying to reach the high, the vault of heaven, as he calls it, because from there the souls then on the uh, <clears throat> on the outside of the heaven can sit and watch the nature of reality spin. So, so uh, in this struggle to go aloft, because they're following in the gods in their wake, the eleven orders of the gods, there's much confusion and competition, and so. At each point, souls then crash. That is to say, there's a limit. And the question, therefore, is the question that you're raising, which we're touching on here. What determines that? And <clears throat> in the Phaedrus, it's attributed to the fact that the, uh, the souls lack the training. They have to be able to guide their chariot, and therefore the horses, along this difficult trip. Okay, where do you get the training? You don't get it here. This again is, we do, I don't have it here. Again, all the consequences of what? Of your former existence on Earth. You take with you all your education and nurture. That's what you take with you into the next world. Everything you've learned, you take with you. All the education, paideia and, and, and nurture, you take with you, all right? Now, when you then crash, then of course you then come back down, and that is the transition then to this, coming back down and gaining your next reincarnation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, the reason why you, you then return for reincarnation that here is the place you can change your character. Because he attributes the blocking, the character, he, he attributes that to the fact that we fall under the effects of evil communication. He says it's all in our evil communication. Communication with others. They have influenced us. We pick up views from others. And these form our character and therefore, the only way to break free is then to discover what you picked up from others that is blunting your vision. And therefore, it's only on Earth that we can then learn to undo what it is we have picked up inadvertently. So therefore, in the Platonic world, this place is the place for learning. Our Earth is the place for learning. The consequences go into the two other realms, but this is the only place for learning. Because that's why you can take with you your nurture, because that's what you've gained, your nurture and your education. There's an idea where when you decide to reincarnate, you will choose the ideal condition to give yourself best chance to learn the lessons that you have to learn in the next incarnation. Is that included in this yeah. myth? Yeah. Yeah, because it fits your character. Yeah. Uh, you can take the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and line it up against uh, the Phaedo. Now, the Phaedo goes further into this. The Phaedo, the Phaedo's myth takes, uh, goes into this in depth, you see. It goes into this. I was going to say this. So each of the myths take a different part of this and expand it. The second of the six, which is all these, is it just the Republic or is it all of the dialogues? Well, luckily, uh, hopefully it's all of them because they're all splendid. But uh, from what he says, it's what we've said here, so... Uh, um, it seems like in the model of that was presented that the turnkey item is wisdom. Yes. That can, mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of mankind, mm -hmm. it's like culture after culture continues to make the same mistakes because wisdom, it seems, by the time it's learned, it it's, doesn't get passed on somehow. So That's therefore, right. the teacher, That's right. That's right. the teacher, the guide, right. is the most essential element, yeah. Yeah. not only in the model, but in viewed history of somehow mm -hmm. passing those lessons on so the mistakes don't have to keep going. That's right. Right, that's right. 
That's right. I totally agree with you. And that's why I think it's right. Is that fun? That's a good joke. Yes, yes, yes. But I also think it's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, that's, um, that's true for many, many good reasons. Uh, one is, I don't believe you can really teach something that you don't know. You can, you know, and uh, to really present this system, you have to live through it. You know, it's not something that's taught. You have to live through it and see it, be molded by what you see, be challenged by your own experiences, go through the dialectic, go through the contemplation, go through the meditation, go through the art of philosophical midwifery, go through dialectic and all of that. Yeah, yeah. it's quite a uh, consummate art. Yeah, Platonic system is perhaps the most arduous of all of the spiritual systems. And of course, uh, art, this culture, I, sometimes I don't know whether I can call it our culture, but someone's culture. Uh, European culture not only turned it back on all of this, but considered it heretical for a thousand years. You know? All the schools of philosophy exploring these ideas were all condemned, heresy. We only got back into this, into the late 16th century, you know. And Plato, for the English-speaking world, didn't come back until the 19th century. Some of the really great and important works have just been translated since World War II, and there are some works that are still not translated from the ancient period, Damascus especially. So, um, it's worth getting back into. I strongly encourage people to get into it. That's it's the, the great challenge. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Good. My pleasure. Thank you very much for coming and contributing, as you always do. Right? Good group. Thank you again.